Um, we certainly will be able to put the presentations up afterwards and if all else fails on the audio we'll be able to publish um, the questions and the answers as FAQs. So we will have some form of resource available after the webinar for anything you might have missed or for anyone who wasn't able to join us. Um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, I think, without further ado, so that we can get cracking, who is Paul Davies, Operations Director here at the National Archives, who has been pivotal in making our plans for going ahead. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to this webinar. We are of course delighted that we've been able to announce that we will reopen to the public, albeit in a limited way, on Tuesday the 21st of July. My colleagues will describe this service offer in more detail in a moment, but perhaps it will be useful for me to describe what's brought us to this point. Following the government's further relaxation of lockdown measures announced by the Prime Minister on the 23rd of June, which allowed museums, galleries and libraries to open from the 4th of July, the National Archives sought and received confirmation from DCMS that this relaxation includes archives. We have already completed detailed recovery planning and preparation work, initially in accordance with the government's guidance, working safely during COVID-19 in offices and contact centres, and subsequently referring to the reopening guidance published for museums, galleries and libraries. We have carried out all the necessary COVID secure health and safety risk assessments and an equality impact assessment to ensure that the measures we have introduced are inclusive. All our recovery planning is based on the safety and well-being of staff and visitors. We are confident we have created, as far as is reasonably practicable, a COVID secure building. I will now describe some of the measures we have put in place. We have installed floor markings and temporary signage to help enforce social distancing of two metres. We have perspex screens at public service points and face shields for public facing staff. We've introduced a rigorous cleaning regime during and at the end of each day. We have easy access to sinks for hand washing and we provide hand sanitizer. And finally, we have a document quarantine procedure that ensures that documents cannot be produced to readers within 72 hours of a previous production. We are asking everyone, as part of the booking process, to agree to a coronavirus visitor charter, aimed at encouraging all visitors to do their bit in helping us to ensure everyone's safety. Initially, we will only be able to provide access to our first floor document reading room. All other public facilities will remain closed, including our map and large document reading room, our reference library, our exhibition spaces, our shop and our cafes. We will also be unable to provide many of our usual reading room services, including research advice, record copying and access to our computers. Appointments will be offered for booking online on a first come, first serve basis. The majority of National Archives staff will remain working from home for the moment in order to continue to control the virus and to reduce the impact on public transport. It is also not possible to bring large numbers of staff back due to the social distancing limitations in the building. We will review these arrangements regularly to ensure that they work and continue to meet government guidance and we will expand our services when it is safe and possible to do so.
Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. So that was just a short introduction to our thinking and a little bit of background about why we, we're doing what we're doing. Um, we'll go straight into the next speaker now, I think, which is Debbie French, who's one of our senior managers within the document services team at the National Archives. We are very much looking forward to welcoming our readers back to queue. The team have been working hard to make the experience as safe and well ordered as possible. In order to ensure the safety of our visitors and that of our staff and our records, we've had to limit the number of readers on site per day and access to services has been restricted. Readers are now required to register, book and order their documents at least one week in advance of their visit. We have set up a booking system on Eventbrite, which can be accessed via our website, and seats are released two weeks in advance every Monday morning. Currently, readers can order up to six documents per visit, and in order to give more readers the opportunity to access the archives, bookings are restricted to one visit per week. We will review the number of seats and documents that are available for readers once we have been through the first two weeks of the limited opening. In order to ensure social distancing, signage and floor markings have been put in place and the seating occupancy in our reading room has been reduced. Non-contact bag searches will still take place as readers enter and leave the reading room. And to help facilitate this, we are asking that readers limit the number of items they take into the reading room, with personal belongings being left in the ground floor lockers. Documents after being quarantined will be produced in advance to a reader's pre-booked allocated table. The documents are produced at least 72 hours ahead of a visit and are placed on the reader's trolley by staff adhering to correct hand washing and good hygiene practices on the day of their visit. Wedges if required as well as paper markers will also be available on the trolley. Hand sanitizer is available upon entering and exiting the reading room. If assistance is required, readers can use the motion sensor at the inquiry point to alert staff. At the end of the day, the documents are returned and quarantined for 72 hours. Documents will not be viewed or handled by readers or staff during this period. Reader tickets will only be issued to readers on the day of their booking. Registration to renew or for a new ticket will need to be completed in advance of a visit and readers will still need to provide two forms of ID. Tickets can only be issued if readers have registered in advance. We will not be issuing or renewing tickets for anyone that does not have a booking on the day. As you can imagine, it has taken several weeks of preparation and planning in order for us to be able to set up a reading room solution which would enable our staff and members of the public to return to site safely. To do this we've had to limit the number and types of service that we offer. The map room will remain closed although some map room documents will be available to view in the first floor reading room. Our record copying service, on-site research service, the library and computers will not be available to use. Readers can bring in their own cameras to capture images of the documents. Free Wi-Fi is still available and our record advisors can be contacted via our chat service if any research advice is required. We hope to be able to widen the service in the coming weeks, but we're going to have to do this in a manner that is both sustainable and safe for our staff and readers, while adhering to the current government guidelines. Great, thank you very much, Debbie. So now our third speaker, who is my colleague, um, Natalie Brown, Senior Conservation Manager within the Collection Care Department here at the National Archives. Oh, and bear with us a little bit on this one. It's a very large file. So if there is any lag or technical problems, we will get those sorted.
Hello, my name is Natalie Brown and I am the Senior Conservation Manager for Engagement here at the National Archives. I have been asked to discuss a couple of different areas today, the first of which is record quarantine. It's one of the areas that we have looked into quite extensively as part of the reopening for the National Archives, especially um, looking at quarantine times for different materials. Within this, we considered the scientific research, government guidance, and guidance from the heritage sector more broadly. I know Debbie has already spoken about this, but I wanted to give a bit of background. So what is record quarantine? So quarantine is essentially an isolation period where records that have been handled by staff or readers are quarantined or isolated for a period of time and cannot be handled or reproduced by other staff or readers. This reduces the risk of the COVID-19 virus being transmitted from a record surface or box to a human, as the virus can only survive on surfaces for a limited amount of time. So by quarantine records, the virus will deactivate naturally. We know from the available scientific research that the virus can survive on different materials for different amounts of time, although it's generally agreed that the risk of transfer from materials like paper, plastics and cardboard is much lower than other transmission pathways, such as respiratory close contact. Much of the initial testing in the scientific studies was laboratory based and therefore could not be directly applied to an archival setting. And a lot of the earlier recommendations for quarantine were based on studies of other coronaviruses. So this is why there hasn't been a definitive answer for quarantine times yet. However, through the recent Realm project, which is the reopening archives, libraries, and museums based in the US, we have a much clearer idea of the viral persistence of how long the virus will remain active on archival materials specifically. The tests are still ongoing, but I would recommend looking at their initial findings. They're testing a variety of materials like uh, book covers, paper pages, DVD cases. We now know that the virus survives longer on plastic materials than on paper. So we have opted for a 72 hour document quarantine period, which is aligned with the realm findings. This takes into account the varied material within our collection, which is mainly uh, paper, plastics and parchment. And because our collection is so large, we thought it best to have a blanket rule for all material. But with all COVID-19 guidance, we are updating this as new research and government guideline, guidelines come into effect. As well as material, other factors can affect viral persistence. This includes environmental factors like temperature and relative humidity. The Canadian Conservation Institute technical note on caring for heritage collections during the COVID-19 pandemic and the Realm Literature Review outlined, outlined this available research really well, so I'd recommend reading these. And I'll share my screen with all the links at the end of the presentation. But in brief, we know that refrigeration temperatures, so from six, uh, sorry, four to six degrees centigrade, prolong viral persistence. Between room temperature, so around 20 to 22 degrees centigrade and 37 degrees centigrade, there is little change in persistence. There is less information, however, around the effect of temperatures between this six to 20 degrees Celsius range. And this is the range where most repositories sit in, so the full effect of temperature is still an unknown. When looking at relative humidity, it's been found that uh, lower relative humidity, so between 20 and 30 percent, increases the rate of infection, while higher relative humidity, so above 40 percent, shorten viral persistence. Um, in laboratory tests examining the transfer of viruses from materials to skin, this medium humidity range, so between 40 to 60 percent, was shown to enhance the likelihood of transfer from surface to human, while low humidity uh, reduces the transfer. So when we are looking at how to interpret this, these findings, um, we didn't think there was enough evidence to change our practices around environmental controls, especially be considering the potential impact on long-term preservation of the records. Our collections are happy at this medium range for relative humidity and only a small part of our collection is housed in refrigerators. The environments of TNA spaces could enhance the transfer of viruses from materials to skin. However, the quarantine period of 72 hours should negate this. 
We also looked at protective uh, equipment or personal protective equipment, PPE, as a mitigation measure. In preparing to open, we looked mainly at the government guidance and the policies within the heritage sector. Uh, DCMS have recently published guidance on PPE in the heritage setting, and we are following government guidance on this subject. A key point for TNA is that we are minimizing the requirement of PPE by using other mitigations, such as reducing staff to visitor interaction, things like social distancing, sneeze screens, and quarantining documents. Just as before COVID, PPE is and should be a last resort for mitigating such risks, as the role of PPE in providing additional protection is extremely limited in this setting. Our focus really has been on creating health and safety risk assessments for each role and where staff do have to interact with visitors without the benefit of things like screen, um, knee screens, sorry. We do offer the use of a face visor rather than a mask and gloves. As a whole, an essential part of our risk management strategy has been to communicate well with our staff through risk assessments, individual conversations with line managers, videos, tutorials, and written guidelines. When generally discussing the use of gloves in an archival setting, we also do need to discuss gloves when handling documents. We do not allow gloves to be worn while, while readers and staff are handling collection material. This is a preservation measure as gloves decrease your manual dexterity. Instead, we are actively promoting good hand, hand sorry, good hand hygiene practices and quarantining documents. The only time this is allowed is when readers are handling photographic materials without protective sleeves, and here the readers will use well-fitting nitrile gloves. I have also been asked to discuss the use of hand sanitizer. Like most public and workspaces, we are promoting good hygiene, hand hygiene practices to tackle virus transmission. If washing your hands with soap is not possible, hand sanitizer products provide an alternative way to reduce this disease transmission, and we do offer hand sanitizer at TNA. We looked more closely at this because of a Library of Congress study that investigated if alcohol and water-based hand sanitizers leave residues on paper documents that could eventually degrade the material. And it was found that alcohol-based sat how alcohol-based hand sanitizers induced a significant negative color change compared to the water-based alternatives. But if you do look a little bit closer at the study, it was in a laboratory and they used something called artificial, um, accelerated artificial degradation. And here there is inherent uncertainty within this method. We, there ca we therefore cannot be certain if the same changes would occur through long-term document aging. Hand sanitizer was also applied directly to the paper, so it's not mimicking how we use how we would use this in an archival setting, unless you're spilling it on the document. Um, in no way am I disputing the findings of the study. We actually did use it when considering our guidance around hand sanitizer, but currently at TNA we are offering alcohol-based hand sanitizers to readers and staff as an alternative measure to hand washing. We are not allowing hand sanitizer in document handling areas, although as Debbie has said, we are allowing sanitizer upon entering and exiting reading rooms. This is also in line with our preservation policy of not allowing uh, liquids in document handling areas. We have been looking into water-based hand sanitizer as an alternative for these spaces. However, this conversation is ongoing as water-based hand sanitizers have less reliable activity against bacteria and viruses than alcohols. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about air conditioning. Air circulation and changing environmental conditions is another topic that's been cropping up quite a lot. There is industry guidance available, but nothing yet has been issued for the heritage sector. And it's not something from a collection management point of view we have investigated in depth at the National Archives. Uh, RIVA, which is the Federation of European Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Associates, which is an industry organization, has issued COVID-19 guidance, um, a guidance document, as has the Health and Safety Executive and the Chartered Institute of Building Services and Engineers. 
But again, these are all very general guidelines. If you are looking at these documents, it's important to remember that some of this guidance just isn't suitable for collection areas in GLAM institutes. And a colleague from the National Museums Liverpool recently highlighted that in the Riva guidance, it states that in buildings equipped with central humidification, there is no need to change humidification system set points, usually 20 to 20 sorry, 25 or 30 percent. This is obviously very different from the optimum archival conditions that we would expect. Opening windows to boost ventilation, again, is not something that we recommend from a preservation point of view, as it creates fluctuating environments, and this can affect hydroscopic materials like paper and parchment. Not to mention, it's also a route for insects to get into your collection. From a collections point of view, continuing to maintain a stable environment is important. And as I mentioned before, the conditions that are recommended for the purposes of collection care will also have beneficial effects in decreasing viral persistence. So I'm just going to share my screen so you can see the links that I have been discussing and um, I think we'll be able to send these links around to the participant list as well. If you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to um, contact me. Thank you. Great, thank you, Natalie. Um, I, I myself haven't had any problems with any of those technically, so hopefully that's the same for all of you and you've been able to hear everything throughout and see everything throughout. Um, right, so the last speaker that we have today, really pleased, um, Joe, that you were able to join us and get involved in this. It's Joe Terry, Head of Archives and Heritage at Staffordshire County Council. Uh, we invited Joe to come along to present a, a different perspective on, on a service that's reasonably far forward as well with its plans. So hopefully that will be helpful uh, when you come to thinking about your own settings and your own context. Hi, I'm Joanna Terry and I'm Head of Archives and Heritage for Staffordshire County Council. I'm going to talk briefly about how we quickly locked down our service and have more slowly planned for its recovery. First, just a bit of background about the service. I'm responsible for three different services, Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent Archive Service, which is a joint service with Stoke-on-Trent City Council. We're an accredited archive service and a place of deposit. The County Museum, which is the county's museum service and includes museum development. We're an accredited museum service. The William Salt Library, a private charitable library managed by a charitable trust and delivered by the Archive Service. It holds the county's local studies collection, as well as William Salt's original collection. This is an overview of how we've moved through the phases of this current pandemic. In early March, we were introducing hygiene measures and resurrecting plans from the swine flu, looking at business continuity elements in our emergency plan. By mid-March, we'd closed our exhibition and events, stopped on-site volunteering, and were planning to close the service, which we'd done by Friday the 20th of March. Once lockdown was announced, the focus was on getting all staff able to work from home. Fortunately, the County Council's drive towards smart working meant most staff had laptops, or we could let them use ones that had been for volunteers. Everyone was able to work from home by the end of March, we enacted the emergency plan and set up an emergency WhatsApp group. From April, 40% of the team were involved in the response, mainly supporting the vulnerably shielded category. During April, we also established a remote service, answering some inquiries and putting others on hold until staff returned to site. Essential checks on buildings and collections continued throughout. From April through to May, we increased our online offer with fun and interactive social media and established a remote volunteer offer. We started planning for recovery, which was part of a corporate approach. In June, the response was starting to reduce in line with demand and our recovery plans increased apace. We gained the COVID secure certificates, which meant that more staff could return to our sites. In turn, this meant more remote orders and research could be fulfilled as we had more staff available. 
At the end of June, our recovery plan received corporate sign-off and the reopening date was agreed. Today, we start implementing our phased recovery plan, which we will monitor and review. Almost all members of staff were able to work from home on projects which shared the history of Staffordshire and Stoke. Many worked on converting paper catalogues to online, increasing information in Gateway to the Past. We also completed essential checks on collections, maintained a remote inquiry service and fulfilled some digital copy orders where we could access images. At Staffordshire Record Office, our inquiries were down by just 25%. We increased the number of digital activities on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram with quizzes such as where on your doorstep to guess the location of an image and provided more content for Staffordshire Day and VE Day both in May. And we launched our YouTube channel. We made a conscious decision to maintain contact with our volunteers and developed a learning room blog where we shared guides to research and an online paleography course. At the same time, 40% of our staff supported the vulnerable self-isolator cell, led by the Library and Arts Service. A small team at Stoke-on-Trent City Archives also played their part in supporting the response, with one member of the team working on the contact centre helpline. The impact of this for the first quarter of the year is that we've seen a 120% increase for visitors to Pass Track website, 33% increase to our main website and online catalogue, 89% increase for social media and nearly 9,000 views of our newly launched Tide Maps in just one month. And our new YouTube channel has seen 857 views. We've got 45 volunteers who are working remotely for us and they've told us how much they valued this and that it's helped divert them from the lockdown. It's really important to us to keep a service offer going and increase the online impact. This has helped keep our profile up within our authority and this is important in ensuring that you are at the front forefront to recover your service and not at the end of a long list of buildings. Staffordshire County Council's approach was to capture what we learned during COVID-19 and challenge services to think about what we could do differently. The approach recognised that some things would change for good and never return to how they were. A key impact has been the shift into home working which is set to continue. The governance for the recovery of services was established in early May. The senior leadership team has oversight of the whole process and a corporate planning and recovery group was led by our assistant director Janine Cox and the assistant director for strategy and public health prevention. Each directorate had its own recovery group with our services in the families and community directorate and in the communities recovery group. The library manager coordinated this group and I coordinated the subgroup for culture, rural and safer communities which included our services. We planned recovery at a high level, sharing ideas, approaches and early recovery plans. We fed back concerns and issues to the communities group, for example, the need for a simple risk management template, guidance on risk assessments from our health and safety team, and pleas for advice and support around what to do about public toilets. Below the corporate subgroup was the archive and heritage management team, to which we added our premise manager, who played a key role in the planning. Our approach to recovery was to ask lots of questions for each phase of recovery and capture it in a detailed spreadsheet. This included public services in lockdown, which addressed setting up revised procedures to deal with remote inquiries and fulfil ones that did not require a visit to site. We then moved on to look at all remote services. This covered increasing them as staff were able to return to site. We simplified procedures, forms and enabled them all to be completed remotely by staff. We moved to copying and scanning on site and then all of the processes completed remotely. For the resumption of on site services, this looked at liaison with communities recovery group, health and safety in offices, public spaces and for volunteers, communication with the public, staffing the public service and reviewing public service routines. It also included training requirements as we'd lost several key staff during lockdown. The spreadsheet idea came from the Chief Archivist and Local Government Group. One of the archivists on the service management team undertook to complete a detailed analysis, talking to almost all staff, asking what their concerns were, the potential solutions, who was responsible and the action required. Taking a bottom-up approach was helpful to build confidence and trust with staff. The feedback was captured from the spreadsheet and then turned into a fairly detailed Word document highlighting areas requiring decision. 
decision making rested with the archive and heritage management team, including our premise manager. She was the first member of staff to regularly resume working on site to keep it safe and ensure contractor visits could continue to carry out maintenance visits. She was also the key contact to liaise with the health and safety team, feeding back to head of service and public service lead and museum service lead. Approvals of plans left, rested with a corporate recovery group, but also ensuring the Joint Archives Committee and Williamsport Library Trust were consulted on key decisions. A major decision we took was not to reopen the Williamsport Library. This was due to the small rooms in the listed building and also loss of service, loss of staff during the lockdown. A service restructure was put on hold and for three staff they decided to retire anyway. This meant a reduction in the public service team at both sites. A high level recovery plan, pulling out key issues and the time frame, was submitted to the corporate recovery group and signed off in June. The County Council Health and Safety Team provided a lot of support and guidance. We were able to get our buildings onto the list to be visited and once a corporate risk assessment was issued in May, we could adapt it to our own sites. The key requirement was to implement a one-way route around our buildings where possible. We were able to do this at Staffordshire Record Office, but not at the Williamsport Library or Museum. We are still encouraged to work from home where possible and had to submit occupancy returns so that numbers of staff on site are reduced. We have a risk assessment for each site which covers buildings and processes and individual risk assessments have been completed if people fall into the clinically vulnerable or extremely clinically vulnerable group. These individuals are asked to work at home. Our health and safety team issued our COVID-19 secure certificates in June. They also gave us initial personal supplies of hand sanitizer and alcohol wipes. We ordered sneeze screens and a hand sanitizer station early on linking up with our library service. The number of public seats have been, has been reduced from 16 to 4 and for July there is no access to PCs or microphone. Access to hard copy catalogues is by staff only. We referred to the checklist produced by the National Archives and guidance published by Libraries Connected and talked to colleagues in other services, especially about toilets. Talking to others was useful, through, especially through the Chief Archivist and Local Government Group and Archives West Midlands. The Calglist serve had many responses on the topic of reopening, which accolated and identified the key issues for archive services. These themes were useful for discussion with Archives West Midlands at a workshop at the end of June. There is almost complete consensus around advanced booking and pre-ordering of documents, and we followed this route. Some of our staff wanted the option to do on-demand production, but we've agreed not to do this at the start. Our approach is to start quite tight and then relax procedures as we gain confidence and can ascertain demand. Quarantine for books is again pretty consistent on 72 hours. We will implement this for local studies books, but we are using 24 hours for paper and parchment. This was based on the advice of our conservator who had referred to Public Health England advice that the risk from books with a cardboard or paper cover is negligible after 24 hours. Bringing our staff back to road test our procedures has meant that we've been able to have meetings with them face to face and address issues that have cropped up and work out quite detailed processes and procedures. There have been regular updates from me by email during lockdown and these will continue as we start to open up. We announced we were opening on Tuesday the 7th of July by issuing a press release at the same time as social media. We informed our key stakeholders shortly before the press release was issued. We used the same templates that our library service have used to publicise our approach. They have helped us to adapt them and it ensures that we have a similar approach which is clear, consistent, while still being welcoming. We are open today for the first time in 17 weeks and have three readers in our search room. It feels like a really big achievement and I'm immensely proud of my team and grateful for their positive approach during a really worrying time. We intend to maintain our online offer and we are seeing an increasing number of remote copying orders. We will continue our remote volunteer offer for those 45 people who have kept going. The work hasn't finished though and we will be monitoring our processes closely and adapting them especially if government guidance and our own local authority guidance should change, for example around face coverings. During August, we'll monitor and review and we'll start Saturday opening if all goes well. 
we've got our first deposit due, so we will also work out a safe process for receipt and handling. We're also launching our Lockdown Memories project, which involves archives, museum and libraries and arts, to record how Staffordshire responded to the pandemic. We're going to review our business continuity plan in case of a local outbreak and temporary closure of the service. During September, we hope to be able to return our volunteers to site, but we will continue with remote volunteering. In October, we will be reopening the History Access Point in Litchfield, but with a new offer to provide more exhibition space. We consulted on, using, on the use of the HAP in January, using the survey results and impact of COVID-19. It will look different when we reopen. From November onwards, we will continue to monitor our procedures and revise as guidance changes or we respond to our own local circumstances. This virus will be with us for some time. We've learnt a lot about ourselves and our service. It's clear we can do more online and we can all work from home. What remains to be seen is where future demand for our service will be. Will people come back? Will the remote demand continue? What can we do differently? I think that whether we like it or not, our services will transform from what they were. What is key is that we learn from this and ensure our service is able to adapt to change and take opportunities which may arise. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Joe. And yeah, that's a massive achievement. So congratulations to you and thank you again for coming, especially today, which is your first day of uh, reopening. Um, we really do appreciate it. So um, that concludes the presentations. Um, we have had a few questions pre-submitted, so I think I'll just go through some of those now, um, which will give you a bit of a chance to digest what you've heard. It's, it is a lot of information um, and be thinking about any other questions for follow up that you'd like to ask through the chat, which um, I think should be at the bottom of most of the most of the screens if it's anything like mine. OK. So in terms of pre-submitted questions, actually a lot of them were about quarantining um, and also air conditioning. Now, a lot of that was covered particularly in detail by Natalie, but also other colleagues' presentations. So again, um, we won't start with that, but do have a think right now if there's something you feel you would like to discuss a bit further and pop it in the chat. Um, so one thing that was also asked, which hasn't come up yet, as a topic in these presentations is about the test and trace service and what we're doing with the information that we collect. So um, we'll be keeping it for 21 days and obviously we may be sharing it with that NHS service. Um, if somebody objects to having their data shared in this way, will they still be allowed to book a space for research? So if you don't mind, Paul, um, I think we agreed that that would be one of the areas that you were happy to talk about. Sure, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I realise when I, I pre-recorded my presentation, I introduced myself, but fortunately Emma did it for me. So I'm, I'm the Operations Director at uh, the National Archives in Kew. Yeah, a track and trace is, uh, is an interesting one. Our data protection officer has spent, officer has spent many hours looking at, at uh, a track and trace. Um, and essentially what, we, what we've said in our Eventbrite booking system is that booking a slot is conditional on providing your information. And in doing so, you make that information available to us. Uh, we will look after it for 21 days. And if we are requested by NHS Track and Trace, we will provide it. So the inference on that being, if you're unwilling to provide those details, then I'm afraid you don't book a slot. Um, and I, you know, we all have a duty um, in order to, to, to prevent the spread of the virus um, and, and to stay alert. Uh, and I think that that is part of the deal, if you like, which is linked to our coronavirus uh, visitor charter. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and the other question that has come up is from somebody who's obviously working in a very, very small service, which relates to the kind of practicalities around space, um, ensuring that they are able to put records into a kind of holding area for however many days they're going to be quarantined. Um, and and it, making sure that we don't that there isn't any um, difficulties as a result of that in terms of the handling of the documents in terms of 
um, if everyone's sharing a space, how do readers and um, colleagues um, deal with that? So I wasn't sure if maybe, um, Debbie, that was a, a bit of an opportunity and perhaps Joe, for you to perhaps just describe in a little bit more detail how we're going to um, manage that sort of flow um, with the quarantining in place. Hi, thanks Emma. Yeah, um, clear signage is what I would say. Um, we have the same um, problem. We've got quite a lot of space, but we've also got quite a lot of documents that will be moving through that space, whether they're quarantining before they go to the readers or quarantining when they get back. So we have marked up bays and shelves very clearly marked up with which documents for which days, for what days of quarantine are there. Um, there's um, a space within the reading room, so um, I don't know if I can create more clear. It is about space. You just need to ensure that you have got enough space for um, the documents that you're delivering. So don't um, overpromise. Don't try to do what you've done previously. You need to kind of make sure that the space that you've got fits, the service that you're providing fits the space that, that you've got now with all of the new um, recommendations and, and so on, restrictions um, that we've, we're all trying to work to. Thank you very much. Um, Joe, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to switch my camera off. Is it cool? <laughs> Oh yes, it has. Um, yeah, space is, is an issue. We've got um, one of the diagrams I showed was our lovely one-way route and the map, which I've had to refer to because I, I experience getting lost in my own office now. But we've got space allocated. Um, we've got an overnight strong room, which we use anyway, where people wanted to keep items out. Well, that will be used for quarantine. And then we've got um, the room lots for our events and volunteers but that's not in use at the moment so we're using that space as well and then we will be what I didn't say in the presentation but whilst we've closed the Williamsort library we are making the collections available in the search room so again we've allocated a room in the Williamsort library that's for for quarantine but we're also like yourselves limiting the number of documents that people can see at one time and we have an advertised number but it's up, up to 10 and it will depend on we're trying to be sensible and discuss it with people. So if it's 10 consecutive things, <clears throat> then we might let them have like a whole box just to minimise the handling by staff. It's kind of like using a bit of common sense, I suppose, as well. But I'm sure that space will be an issue for smaller services, definitely. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. OK, so that kind of concludes the, the pre-submitted um, questions. I don't see anything in the chat at the moment in terms of anything additional or any follow-ups anybody would like to ask. So happy to just give a minute there um, in case uh, things are still filtering through and processing. Okay. I think I can see a question for me, Emma. So, yeah, uh, is this yeah. one that's just come in from... Uh, about inclusive planning. Oh no, I can see one on volunteers in lockdown. Okay, fine. Well, go ahead then, and then I'll take the next one that I've just received. Okay. Um, yeah, the volunteers have been um, inputting sort of um, indexes collections into um, into spreadsheets, or they've been working on um, card indexes. So we. For some of them, we scanned or photographed them. My staff were incredibly resourceful. They did a lot of this just before we locked down. They did quite a lot so that we could then issue it out to volunteers who, who begged for something to do. Some of them didn't want digital images. They wanted hard copies. So the premise manager, who again was very resourceful, adapted her role and did a bit of photocopying and posted it out to people. Um, the other thing that people did, we managed to get access to find my pass for our volunteers. So they did research by using that website, using our collections on that site to um, add to our project blogs. So those are the sorts of things that they've done. Right, excellent. Thank you for that. So um, I'm getting some questions in to me, um, which I'll just quickly go through. So this is for TNA. Um, about inclusive planning and do we have plans to offer support or access to those who cannot pre-book from home due to something like a lack of a computer or internet access 
Um, and then there is also a follow up there about group study. Um, I wonder if that might be best addressed to you, Paul, in the first instance. Hello, yes, am I, uh, am I, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Right. Um, so at the moment, you know, we, our principle all along, as you know, has been to start small and grow from there. So uh, I spoke about first come, first served. Um, we do have the means where uh, people may, attempting to make a booking can inform us if they have any uh, special requirements. Uh, and that will elicit a, a separate conversation with them so that they don't have to declare any protected characteristics uh, on the booking portal. Um, we also have our standard uh, contact and, and chat service. Um, and so if someone was to contact us via that route to say that they're unable to make a booking through the uh, through the traditional um, the, the, the online version, then we would do our level best to help them. But bearing in mind, we had 2000 uh, odd um, uh, attempts to book uh, a, a ten percent of our slots. That that's quite that's quite tricky. Um, so and we're already aware of some of the feedback we're having or what the pinch points are. Uh, and as soon as we're able to um, adapt the service and grow the service, uh, we will. Um, and so, you know, for instance, the number of documents per reader is clearly an issue. Um, the inability currently to book two uh, sessions in a week is a concern for people who are potentially traveling long distances. And of course, we understand that. Um, but what we don't want to do is, is as, as Debbie said, is to over promise. So the idea is to start small. And we're already learning from some of the data that's coming from Eventbrite um, about people's habits and that not everybody is demanding um, the, the, the requesting the five records. And so we're, we're already considering what some of our options might be to, to grow the service as we go forward. Okay, fantastic, thank you. While we've got you, um, are you able to say a word about how we came up with the length of time we've decided to offer documents um, per day to researchers? Uh, I can't. I think that's probably a better question for for Debbie. Um, okay. So the, the detail planning was 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 done by document services, as you can imagine. Hi. Yeah. The um, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> the screen's gone. Um, the decision was made based on um, our staffing numbers, um, the amount of space that we have. Um, and the number of documents that we felt that we could make available. So we are doing a maximum of six documents per day. And we know that with our documents, that could be six individual pieces of paper or one document could be three, four, five, six boxes. So it was about how much work people could undertake realistically within that time. What we didn't want to do was be producing records that people wouldn't have time to see. Equally, we didn't want to open up reading rooms and then not have the staff that were able to cover both ends. So um, some of the issues that are coming from our teams are about um, using public transport to get to work. So we're um, flexing the time so people work. So some will be starting a bit earlier, some will be starting a bit later, a few will be working in between, but we're not back to full capacity. So um, as we have said, we are kind of starting small, trialing it for a couple of weeks, seeing what works, what doesn't. Like Paul says, quite early on, we're seeing quite a lot of information that's coming through Eventbrite. Um, and we're just going to keep reviewing it from there. And I just add, there was just one point that you made before about um, accessibility and people that maybe don't have access to online. We do yeah. have um, the new, yeah. new phone message has been changed and there is now a contact number where you can leave a voice message. So if you don't have internet access, there is a number that you can call and one of the team will get back to you to talk about making the booking for you. That is purely for people that don't have or can't use um, the internet for whatever reason. Brilliant, thank you, really helpful. Okay, I think the next question is probably for Natalie, it's around cleaning. Um, so particularly cleaning in the storerooms where there might be some conflicts with the way cleaners operate. Um, in particular, this specific question is about misting the rooms as part of the cleaning process um, and whether or not that is a particularly good idea for archival documents. Yeah, so yeah, cleaning has come up in a couple of conversations and you know when you when you're cleaning somewhere especially that houses collections you want to ensure that you're choosing a application 
that is very controlled and um, reduces the risk of any overspray. So mistiness it could produce this overspray. You also have to be quite careful when choosing a disinfectant and it's important to consider the contact wow. times in collection spaces are used frequently and uh, appropriate products for particular surfaces. You know, disinfectants that leave residues or contain additives are not appropriate to use around collection spaces. So uh, if the, speaking about electrostatic disinfection sprayers, um, again, the CCI technical note that I mentioned again goes into a lot of detail around this, but they do recommend that this kind of um, electrostatic disinfection sprayers is not appropriate for collections um, or spaces where collections are housed or handled. Um, as well as this, uh, quaternary armonium compounds are, mo are more prone to leaving residues. So again, something to consider. And it's these simple solutions like ethanol water or hydrogen peroxide that are best for collection spaces. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, I have one more question that came to me privately, and then uh, we'll just have a couple of minutes to hand over to the to the to my colleagues as well, who've also been receiving questions. So this is about um, document access for readers, um, where the normal practice might be to provide help, physical help, you know, adjusting book stands or or um, speaking directly to readers about the documents themselves. Is there any advice about that? Um, is it better to uh, obviously just keep your distance and only offer verbal advice? What happens if you might see somebody mishandling something? Um, I think maybe that might be for you, Debbie. I yeah, <laughs> that's what we'll be doing our socially distancing invigilation. So. Um, the map room, usually that's the room where we would have documents that you, readers would need help um, either getting to the tables or, or un unrolling and so on. So as we're not dealing with that in the first instance, so it's just a first floor reading room. So it's our smaller um, documents. Um, if people do need help, um, as we were saying, our staff are provided with um, gloves or um, the face masks, the shields, um, masks, etc. But um, we'd obviously try to keep our distance um, as much as possible when it comes to people maybe infringing on the rules. Um, our CCTV is still in operation. We will still have a member, a couple of members of staff in and around the reading rooms, not on the staff side, so they can still intervene. Um, and we are quite lucky that the space is, is quite large enough that we could stand on one side of the table, still be distant from the reader and still provide some um, advice and guidance on that. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, so we do just have a few short minutes um, for anything that's come through to you, Mike or Caroline or Georgie or Jonathan that I can't see in my own area. Nothing from me, thanks, Emma. Okay, Mike. No, Georgie, no. Mike, anything no. from you? Okay, Jonathan, do you have any of the ones that came through to the ASD account? Uh, yes, I think we've covered quite a few of them. Um, I don't think we've covered the topic of um, someone was asking about uh, staff bubbles, if they have, they have people from across the county and different working locations across those and the risk of lo local lockdown affecting service delivery. Um, so if kind of where staff are both based in terms of their work and their home, whether that's being tracked at all or should it should affect things. Okay, thank you. Is that, is that for you, Paul? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the, the, the potential of a local lockdown is, is an issue for us all, uh, but particularly those who have a number of, of different sites or remote sites. But equally, if uh, if a key area for, for where staff live, for which, which in our case is the neighbouring borough of, of Hounslow, um, if that were to suffer a, a, a local lockdown, then we, we would we would feel an instant resource hit on that. Um, equally, if Richmond, uh, the, the the area that we're in, or Q itself, were to were to go into local lockdown, then clearly we'd have to, we would have to follow all um, all local uh, guidance and local advice, which I suspect would mean reverting um, to to our original lockdown position. So I I, th I think my, my my colleague from Staffordshire described um, revisiting business continuity um, procedures. We all moved out of the building in a bit of a hurry um, and so it's time well spent certainly what we've done is is just revisit uh, in terms of a desktop um, exercise 
what we do in those two situations. Uh, a significant number of staff unable to come uh, to, to work because they've been locked down uh, locally to their homes or, or we suffer a lockdown ourselves. So I'd, I'd certainly recommend just a walk through, talk through of, of how uh, each of you would deal with that situation. Brilliant, thank you. Joe. did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to start my video, yeah. Yeah, we found that our original business continuity plan was pretty rubbish because it was designed for the swine flu pandemic and um, this is completely different. We hadn't envisaged lockdown. So um, that's why I put it on is that we're going to start re-looking really at that now. We've got a bit of, obviously the focus is on getting open. But uh, yeah, we've got staff live in different parts of the county. Our sites are pretty much in Stafford. So the issues for us would be if Stafford were part of a, a local outbreak and lockdown. Um, if, if some of our staff who live away from the staff are affected, um, potentially less affected, it depends on which, which members of staff. What we've, um, we did think originally that we would work in cohorts, but that soon broke down. We just don't have enough staff to do that. As soon as somebody's on leave um, or sick for another reason, it wouldn't be possible to cohort them. But, um, but yeah, the council's asked us to min minimise the number of people that are in. It's still, the instruction is still work at home wherever possible and you should only be in if your job role actually requires you to be. So we're just sort of doing, doing what we can really. But um, yeah, that's why I want to sort of get the business continuity plan very up to date so that if we have to go into a lockdown, however, short or long or whatever, then we can, we can do that um, more quickly with speedier decision making, I think. Great, thank you. Hopefully that's, that's answered those questions. Um, does anybody, have, Jonathan, did you have any more, anything that's particularly pressing? We've got about a minute to go. I think we've covered a lot of them. Let me just check for the latest ones. Um, have we covered actually about, uh, we've mentioned about quarantine of records, but have we talked about whether book rests and worms and other items are being quarantined or not? Um, a bit, I think. Natalie, is there anything you wanted to quickly add? Actually, perhaps this might be a question for Debbie, uh, ah. because uh, within the D DSD, protocols they are looking at book wedges and book supports and things like that. Okay, you've got 30 seconds Debbie. Go. Um, yes is the answer. So um, wedges will be made available on individuals trolleys. So when the trolleys um, are made up for readers the wedges if the records require them will also be on the trolleys and we have enough of them and they've been separated out so they won't be used the next day they'll also go into quarantine so they'll be recycled in that way so, yeah. wow okay fantastic thank you so i don't think we've really got time for anything else but as i said we will collate um, the responses and the questions and make this recording available online so you should have access to all of that to revisit um, we completely understand everyone's got different circumstances different contexts different challenges although we do obviously also have a lot of similarities so please keep up the dialogue that we've been having it's really useful for us um, to understand your your challenges and to hopefully be able to support where we can on those um, I think that's really my plea keep checking our uh, pages online because we are updating those all the time and we are linking to as much of the other guidance as we can from other bits of the sector and the wider cultural heritage sector um, and uh, yes i just want to say good luck to everybody let us know what you're doing keep us up to date with your plans um, and we are we are here so um, let's keep on keep on moving forward everyone's done so much and um, i really hope that it all goes really well Thank you, and we'll speak to you soon. And thank you again to my colleagues from TNA and to Joe especially for joining us today. Bye.